Thank you so much for coming. I'm Ann Woolett, I'm curator of paintings here at the J. Paul Getty Museum, and I work particularly on our northern paintings before 1800. Um, and it's my pleasure to speak with you today. Um, we are going to take a closer look at the career and the character of the Flemish painter Jan Bruegel the Elder, one of the luminaries of the Baroque period, whose exquisite descriptive style was admired by contemporaries both north and south of the Alps. The Getty's collection includes three marvelous and very different paintings by Bruegel, and I am going to go with Bruegel, I should tell you, as opposed to the proper Flemish, Bruegel, uh, just because I think it might drive you all crazy. <laughs> but just know we're, we're in our own, own zone here with this usage. Uh, so the Getty has one of the largest groups of, the, of his work here in the western United States. All three paintings are currently on view, you'll be happy to know, in the East Pavilion. And together they represent some of Bruegel's key achievements. There's the Sermon on the Mount, a luminous small painting on copper teeming with minutely rendered figures of great variety, which dates from the late 1590s and the artist's early career in Antwerp. And the majestic entry of the animals into Noah's Ark, a verdant scenic landscape in which all creatures live together in harmony. Bruegel was the master of this specialized subject known as a paradise landscape. Every one of the myriad birds, reptiles, amphibians, and furred creatures are so precisely rendered with Jan's extraordinary brushwork that they can be easily identified. One of the most familiar paintings in the Gettys collection, the Noah's Ark, is often the starting point for young visitors making their first trip to this or even a um, museum. And finally, there is this uh, robust forge interior painted on an unusually large scale. A long vaulted passage leads to a cavernous interior filled with the products of Vulcan, the god of fires, furnaces. We see cannons, a bell, haphazardly piled decorative parade armor, a crossbow and a chronicons to wind it, and bridles for the steeds in the background all evoking a clamorous, hot setting for the illicit tryst between the gods Mars and Venus, which are painted by Peter Paul Rubens. In the final stage of painting, Bruegel complimented Rubens' lovers with his own signature duo, a pair of exotic and adorable guinea pigs, <laughs> imported from Peru. Bruegel and the slightly younger Rubens were close friends, and the most famous painters in Antwerp. About two years after this collaborative painting was completed, a nobleman, Duke Johann Ernst of Saxony, visited Antwerp and viewed works by both Bruegel and Rubens and their studios. The Duke evidently considered Antwerp's quote-unquote celebrated painters equal masters of contrasting styles. He wrote in his travel journal, quote, Rubens generally paints large pieces, all truly of life size, but artfully beautiful and after life. But Bruegel paints little paintings with landscapes, but so subtle and artful, kunstlich is the word he uses, that you can only wonder to look at them. In keeping with his dynamic, often large-scale paintings, Rubens's character is easily imagined today. The elegant, erudite court painter, famously described, probably somewhat exaggerated, um, by Charles Sperling, a Danish physician in 1621, as the preeminent multitasker. Upon entering Rubens' studio, he found, quote, the great artist at work. While still reading, he was having Tacitus read aloud to him, and at the same time was dictating a letter. When we kept silent, so as not to disturb him with our talk, he himself began to talk to us, while still continuing to work, to listen to the reading, and to dictate his letter answering our questions and thus displaying his astonishing power. <laughs> Bruegel, by comparison, has been a quieter presence in the history of Flemish art. Modern scholarship has associated him with shared compositions and a large oeuvre encompassing, encompassing a huge variety of subjects. The son of the stupendously popular painter Peter Bruegel the Elder, he has also been received as a secondary member of a famous dynasty at times. In essence, he is usually seen as in a supporting role. There are several reasons for this perspective. Foremost amongst them 
has been the tendency for scholars to view his minute, multi-part compositions as a curiosity, and not the equal of the most highly esteemed subjects from history executed on a grand scale. For a time, um, a wealth of detail obscured a broader view of Bruegel's achievements. Only recently, in the last 20 years or so, I would say, actually, um, Jan Bruegel has become the subject of critical inquiry and contextualization in exhibitions, monographs, and online databases. And I draw your attention to a new uh, venture, janbruegel.net, uh, in which you can peruse a great portion of his known oeuvre. Jan Bruegel was an extremely ambitious and hardworking artist whose paintings on panel and copper were avidly collected by some of the most, foremost connoisseurs of the early 17th century. From correspondence and the physical evidence of collaborative works and those created independently, Bruegel's refined detail was a defining mode in Antwerp. He wielded great authority as a master of the small scale, propelled by an indefatigable and sociable nature. For Bruegel was the glue that bound many of Antwerp's leading practitioners together. So who was the man behind the guinea pigs? Bruegel was born in Brussels in 1568. We see him here in an etched portrait by his friend, Antony van Dyck, from the series of portraits of famous artists published after Jan's death, although certainly uh, Bruegel and van Dyck knew each other. A characterful, austere countenance emerges from the obligatory ruff and sporting a thick mustache and beard. This latter feature, not found in all portraits of the artist, may have been considered a family attribute and a reference to Jan's father. Peter Bruegel, the Elder, here portrayed um, as part of an earlier series of portraits of famous artists in the Netherlands. Peter, who's well known to us as a painter of peasant life, was renowned in his own day for his acute, often acerbic uh, representations of the human condition, such as the famous Flemish Proverbs, which uh, could fill um, an hour's long lecture easily. <laughs> Uh, he's also responsible, of course, for a large and influential body of engraved allegories. And here, the alchemist, uh, so this figure here, toils absurdly to find the philosopher's stone that will turn base metals into gold and silver. And the outcome of his uh, foolish endeavors is visible through the window. His wife and children end up in the poorhouse. Peter also was responsible for a hugely influential group of engraved landscapes based in part on his experience of the Alps during his journey to and from Italy, from the Netherlands, about 1551 to 1554. His painted landscapes introduced a new drama and psychological intensity to the genre. This is in a, quite a large panel, as you can see there. And his landscapes on a small scale, such as this beautiful panel in San Diego at the Timken Museum of Art, present the world view across a steep uh, valley um, with fields, uh, looking across to soaring peaks. In the foreground, the sower is attended by birds and beasts tucked into the landscape around him. Peter Bruegel was in fact far removed from his humble subjects. As a member of Antwerp's circle of humanists, uh, which included the famous map maker, Ortelius. Peter Bruegel spelled his name, B-R-U-E-G-E-L, in capital Latin letters. Our Jan would follow suit, um, as we see here, but he spelled his name with an H. Um, and this is a detail from the Getty Sermon on the Mount. So I hope, actually, from the beginning, we can answer one of those burning questions I know you all have, um, one of those art historical um, problems. Why do we spell the different Bruegel's names differently if they're the same family? And the answer is that we follow the usage of the artist. So, Dad, Peter, no H. Son, um, use the H himself. Um, and actually, I should say, too, this is interesting, this type of lettering, this kind of capital script. I think that um, Bruegel was really uh, looking back to major Renaissance painters in Italy, to Titian, for example, or to Raphael, who um, would spell their names in this way with these single name um, in capitals. So, however, uh, Jan Bruegel uh, never trained with his father, who died a year after he was born. Instead, according to contemporary sources, Jan was taught the technique of Waterwerve, 
a large-scale uh, form of watercolor painting on cloth uh, by his maternal grandmother, Megan Verelst, who was a well-known specialist in the Low Countries in her own right. He moved to Antwerp in 1583 to learn the essentials of oil painting with Peter Hootkent, who was an important art dealer. Jan's elder brother, Peter Bruegel the Younger, met the demand for his father's compositions by replicating them. Uh, though he was very industrious, this seems not to have been a lucrative practice, strangely. Jan forged his own route, maintaining the familiar uh, connection, which was very important in the Netherlands, where continuity and tradition between generations of successful painters was desirable. Um, and he adapted features of his father's work into a brighter even, um, and even more vivid idiom. Like his father, Jan traveled from Antwerp to Italy, uh, visiting Rome and possibly also Venice. He spent time in Naples. In a number of beautiful drawings uh, with masterful application of colored washes, he recorded scenery and monuments such as the Colosseum. Also, like his father, he eschewed any transformative impact of contemporary Italian art on his own art. Although still young during his sojourn, Jan maintained and embraced his Flemishness, an approach that met with success. He arrived in Rome at an auspicious moment, only a few years after the Brill brothers, Matthias and Paul, uh, also from Antwerp, had established a thriving practice as landscape specialists both as easel painters, as suggested by this work, uh, but most significantly as fresco artists. Through uh, various introductions, um, which it would be lovely to know more about uh, specifically, but we don't have the documentation, Jan became associated with um, several connoisseur cardinals, uh, notably Cardinal Francesco Maria del Monte. Most of his output in the early 1590s are exquisite small landscapes on copper, based on the old formula of warmer earth tones in the foreground, moving to green in the middle distance, and finally to blue uh, distant vistas. Uh, kind of a very nice chromatic way of generating a sense of recession, spatial recession. Already at this time, Jan's own particular approach to landscape was clear. Rather than the intimidating terrain and endless vistas of his father, Jan adopted a temper calmer sensibility, which served as a foil for human and natural subjects. The origins of his mature paradise landscapes lie in this period. Bruegel's first representation of paradise and a direct precursor of the Gettys, entry of the animals into Noah's Ark, is this idyllic scene of the creation. It's painted on a sheet of copper, a favorite luxurious support with qualities that allowed Bruegel to demonstrate his remarkably refined technique. God creating Adam takes place as a subsidiary scene in the middle ground. The strong vertical axis of the central tree splits the scene between watery habitats on the left and um, a forest glade on the right. The stream seen here in the lower left contains a related group of creatures, various types of fish and wetland birds. The eye follows the diagonal axis out to the sea where a whale frolics. On the opposite side, at the end of a shaded passage, a giraffe can be seen in silhouette. With this work, Bruegel introduced a favorite organizing principle, a tightly knit group of animals entering together from the right. By cutting the larger animals, the horse and the donkey, in half, basically, uh, they seem to enter the landscape. Perhaps with a touch of horror vacui, Bruegel fills every space. Somehow, a squirrel perches between the stallion and the ostrich that gazes in our direction. The barn owl in the center shares the trunk with an African gray parrot and a splendid peafowl. A number of animals are quite convincingly rendered. The cat, um, the fox, deer, the ox. But others, presumably less familiar at this stage, and I'm thinking particularly of the guinea pigs, which are here, <laughs> um, and the leopard, are more tentative. The stallion has been given a somewhat individual twist. Uh, he even seems to have a little bit of a smile. <laughs> Bruegel met his most important patron, Cardinal Federico Borromeo, in 1593-94, probably in the household of the Colonna family. Borromeo was intensely interested in the natural world 
and highly knowledgeable art lover. After assuming position, the position of Archbishop of Milan in 1595, he would maintain a lifelong support for Bruegel, eventually amassing 16 paintings, by far the largest group of any artist in his impressive collection, which is the basis of the Ambrosiana Museum today. Despite the differences in age and status, Borromeo and Bruegel seem to have been almost kindred spirits. Over 70 letters from Bruegel to his patron survive. Flemish artists seem to have been considered good company in Roman elite circles. They must uh, certainly have seemed engaging uh, as opposed to the highly re reserved style of Romans. Bruegel wrote to Borromeo in rather chatty um, and courteous um, uh, manner, but he was um, totally undaunted by a rather incomplete grasp of Italian. Borromeo's personal spiritual vision of the natural world found profound delight in Bruegel's meticulous descriptive style of painting. His luminous landscape, populated with myriad of marvelous flowers, birds, and animals, corresponded with the cardinal's belief that nature's beauty and diversity was a divine act to be celebrated. Borromeo wrote in, 15, uh, in a book published in 1632, quote, looking then with attentive study at animals, construction and formation, and at their parts, members, and characters, can it not be said how excellently divine wisdom has demonstrated the value of its great works, end quote. It has been proposed that Borromeo, who had complained that his duties in Rome prevented him from spending time in nature, collected Bruegel's landscape landscapes and those of other Flemish artists as a substitute and focus for his meditation on the divinity of nature. Indeed, the concentrations of minute detail, broader spatial recession of Bruegel's landscapes such as this one, which are small enough to hold in the hand, invite prolonged viewing. Bruegel was back in Antwerp in 1596 and joined the Guild of St. Luke in 1597. The city was beginning to recover after three tumultuous decades. The wave of iconoclastic riots that swept through the Low Countries in the late summer of 1566 had a profound effect on art making. Protestant iconoclasts attacked and destroyed church decorations, altarpieces, sculptures, stained glass, as symbols of Catholic political and spiritual power. In the years that followed, Antwerp, an enormous port city with a diverse international population, was briefly governed by Protestant leaders in the early 1580s and subsequently became the bulwark of Catholicism after its surrender to Alessandro Farnese's forces in 1585, following a long siege. At that time, citizens were required to swear an oath of allegiance to the Spanish king and Catholic faith, or they had to actually depart. Many thousands did, including large numbers of artists whose immigration to Amsterdam, Harlem, and other cities in the north engendered the golden age of Dutch painting. Antwerp lost more than half of its population between 1568, when there were about 105,000 residents, um, and 1589, when there were just 42,000. So the Netherlands at this time um, that we'll be speaking today is uh, split into two portions. The southern provinces, part of the Spanish Habsburg Empire, governed from Brussels, and then the north, the breakaway rebel provinces. The southern Netherlands corresponds roughly to the modern state of Belgium today, while the north corresponds to approximately to the country of the Netherlands, which we commonly call Holland, after its most powerful province. In, 15, in the 1590s, um, uh, in Antwerp, repairs to the interior of the cathedral and other churches continued as guilds strove to meet the requirements to refurbish their altars, bringing new commissions for huge altarpieces. The interior of Antwerp Cathedral, with its multiple aisles and columns, provided a spectacular array of the most modern, large-scale devotional paintings. And I'm showing you this, what appears to be a rather terrible image, um, because although there are many, many views of the interior of Antwerp Cathedral, this is one that's rather accurate and shows uh, specific paintings that we know uh, existed in these locations. Um, so um, I feel it's a good representation of probably the density of decoration that one could could have seen there. So in addition to the, the, the newest uh, altarpieces, uh, the, the cathedral featured um, beloved altarpieces by famous artists of the earlier part of the 16th century, such as the startling Fall of the Rebel Angels by Franz Floris for the Swordsman's Guild, which we see here on the right, um, which had survived the 1566 catastrophe. 
Among the wealthy collecting elite, works by Jan's father, Peter Bruegel the Elder, had long been scarce. The remarkable months of the year, for example, commissioned by the wealthy merchant Nicholas Jongelink by 1566, were given to, by the city to the Habsburg governor, um, Archduke Ernst, in 1594, and left the Netherlands. Jan Bruegel thus returned to the southern Netherlands at an auspicious moment. He capitalized on the mania for particular visual strategies associated with his father to propel his own distinct idiom. The Getty Sermon on the Mount is a good example of his strategy. Signed and dated 1598, it's painted on a copper plate, the hard support he employed frequently to showcase his minuscule breastwork and a jewel-like palette. At 10 and a half by 14 and a half inches, it's small enough to be held and scrutinized. Only through close inspection does one locate the subject of the scene, Christ preaching from a rough podium composed of branches. A dense crowd has gathered around him in a forest clearing on a mountain, providing an overlook to a distant port city, as described in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. The assembly amid the trees, and particularly the captivating array of carefully described onlookers in different costumes, some of whom are attentive to the sermon, and others grouped into vignettes. Working in a long-established Netherlandish tradition, Bruegel situates and subverts the religious subject to the larger subject of landscape and the exploration of humanity. This small scene refers in particular to his father's much larger painting on panel, the preaching of John the Baptist, dated 1566, which is today in Budapest. Truly not a representative image, I'm sorry. Here, off-center in the horizontal format, John the Baptist addresses a diverse crowd gathered under the boughs of large oak trees. So he's up here. Produced in the same year as the iconoclastic riots, it's been suggested that Peter Bruegel intended it as an allusion to religious dissent and the Calvinist hedge preachers disseminating Protestant ideas in the countryside, which was one of the contributing factors to the wave of image breaking, along with dire, a dire economic climate. However, the theme may be a much broader view of diversity of mankind guided by a Christian world. While it is difficult to identify the geographic origins of some of the figures from their costumes with precision, um, since the knowledge of other cultures and customs in the 16th century Netherlands was obtained from a, a rather large variety of visual and printed sources. Um, it was clear that Bruegel seems to have been uh, interested in including recognizable travelers to what is otherwise a northern forest. So we see a turbaned man, intended to be seen as a Turk here, who looks out over the crowd from the left side, peeking around the trunk on the left, a curious lansnecht or mercenary soldier identifiable by his kind of spiffy leggings here. A pilgrim with a walking staff, his cap adorned with numerous pilgrim's badges, sits beneath a large tree, almost an outgrowth of the earth, except for his red stockings. So here he's here, and here's his little leg. One of the most striking figures is the woman in the disc-shaped hat, clasping a small child who's usually identified as an Egyptian. And there's the little baby. And to the right, a gypsy man in striped cloak tells the fortune of a European man. Nearby, the extravagantly dressed figure in red and yellow, wearing a close-fitting green cap. Here. They hail from the Orient. Behind him, two men, clerics from a distant land, it seems, converse. Jan painted two versions of uh, his father's painting, the first in 1598, seen here. Though extremely faithful to the content of the 1566 panel, and I really, it's difficult to look at any differences in the figures, he altered the format to include the leafy foliage of the trees, which further diminishes the presence of the Baptist. Jan invoked the theme of diverse travelers drawn to hear the message of faith, making significant changes on an almost microscopic scale. So moving from an evocation of the forerunner or messenger of Christ in St. John the Baptist to Christ, 
uh, which was appropriate to the current climate of the Counter-Reformation. Jan included several of the same figures from his father's scene. Here we see the Egyptian mother, uh, vividly attired in red, occupying the foreground with her child. Um, and to her left is the fortune teller, actually, the same uh, person here, but just dressed differently. We still have the clerics uh, chatting away at the back edge, and these fellows, and this fellow still leaning back. He has that sort of tasseled uh, hat on. Um, the Lonsnecht is still with us, but he's been moved here in the red and blue. Um, and in fact, it's interesting, he also sits next to this lady with the kind of backpack, and she was also in uh, the Peter Bruegel, the Elder Painting. However, um, not all of those present are attending to Christ's discourse on the eight conditions of blessedness. Among them are some of Jan's own inventions. Snacks are being sold on the fringe of the crowd. <laughs> A group of Flemish ladies and gentlemen mingle elegantly in the foreground, um, and the uh, tiny keys uh, hanging from their waists are just visible here. On the right, an intriguing party arrives on the mountaintop. A distinctive horned hairstyle of the woman in yellow, uh, very blonde hair, uh, identifies her as a denizen of Venice. James Wellu was the first to suggest that this mitered style of hair was fashionable in North Italy. This lady closely resembles, in fact, an illustration in Cesare Vecellio's illustrated volume of domestic and exotic costumes published in 1590. Um, and I think we see here the similarity. She has the sort of standing collar on her gown, the sort of V-shaped bodice, and of course, this extraordinary hair. Um, and I thank uh, particularly Davide Gasparotto, who's the head of the paintings department. Um, in fact, a, um, a colleague who hails from this Veneto region uh, for discussing the intricacies of Venetian hair with me, because it was a bit of a question there for a while. This lady and her companion in pink, as well as her page, strikingly attired in red and black, occur in other compositions between 1598 and 1600, and they all look out uh, at the viewer. Bruegel signed and dated the painting at the feet of a young ruffian and two hounds, um, and we've seen his signature uh, in the detail earlier. In Bruegel's sermon in miniature, the landscape features prominently the delicately textured foliage rendered in soft greens, provides a harmonious backdrop to the crowd. Paths through the twisted trunks invite the eye to wander more deeply. The skeletal remains of a horse in the extreme right corner, which became a favorite motif in uh, many landscapes, serves as a reminder of life's brevity and a counterbalance to the lively festival of humanity. It's possible that this work in copper was intended for export, since Jan Bruegel was already acquainted with the tastes of Italian patrons. He was also eager to establish himself with local Antwerp collectors. In the late 1590s, Rubens, aged about 20, was emerging from his training with the erudite Otto van Veen. Their friendship and artistic partnership began in the last years of the decade. Rubens was himself working on a small scale at that time. This beautiful portrait of an architect or geographer at the Metropolitan Museum is the only signed and dated paint, painting by Rubens prior to his departure for Italy in June 1600. But he aspired to be a history painter. Very little is known about his training with Van Veen, but he very probably made drawn studies after small bronzes of figures such as muscular Hercules and horses in dynamic poses. From this rich source material, Bruegel and Rubens developed a new subject in painting, the Battle of the Amazons, in which fierce semi-nude female warriors um, are, are shown in combat on a wide plain. Bruegel executed the landscape and the massive army, and Rubens painted the foreground melee, quoting classical sculptural sources such as the Laocoon. The format is relatively large, which suggests the ambition of Bruegel and Rubens to produce the next generation of collectible history painting in Antwerp. And they succeeded. This painting in Potsdam, long thought to be the original, appears now to be the best version of a lost composition by the pair, um, and there several other versions are known. The genesis of the Amazon stimulated Bruegel to paint his own spectacular scenes after Rubens departed for Italy. 
They are remarkable for their sweeping views and the brilliantly hued and exhaustively detailed exposition of subjects from antiquity, such as the continents of Scipio and the Battle of Issus, seen here featuring Alexander and the family of Darius, which teems with highly original mini-episodes and men and horses in vigorous action. One cannot really describe artistic activity during the first decade of the 17th century as taking place in, quote-unquote, Rubens' absence, as he was still a young, independent master and had not yet established himself as a leading figure when he left for Italy. The, pe the period 1600 to 1610, however, could well be described as the era of Bruegel, an amazingly productive time when he forcefully established not just his particular style for a new modern era, but his central place with, within the artistic community of Antwerp and one of the city's leading citizens. There is some evidence that Bruegel strove to secure places to sell his pictures, writing repeatedly to the court for exemptions from tariffs in other cities. In his early 30s, Bruegel was elected dean of the Guild of St. Luke, which is the Painters Guild, and he served in that capacity with Otto van Veen, or at least uh, Rubens' teacher, in 1602. A few years later, in 1608, he was elected to the prestigious confraternity of Romanists. Members of that elite group had all visited Rome and the tombs of the apostles Peter and Paul. Bruegel entered the service of Albert and Isabel Clara Eugenia, the Archdukes, um, in the early 1600s. As was the case with most artists working for the court, he did not receive an official appointment, but held the position of painter to the royal highnesses by 1608, a designation he shared with other leading artists. By contrast, Rubens, recognized for his skill as a history painter, the most prestigious form of painting, would be accorded the title of court painter and very generous terms with a stipend. Bruegel's position allowed him access to the menageries and botanical gardens of the magnificent and cultured court of the Archdukes in Brussels, um, and also uh, the other palaces and hunting lodges in the countryside. Here, for example, Archduke Albert is portrayed seated before his favorite hunting palace of Tervuren, and Isabella Clara Eugenia, who is a zealous huntress, shown with Marymont Palace over her shoulder. One of the constants in Bruegel's art was his commitment to landscape. In the early years of the 17th century, Bruegel advanced the tradition of his father, Peter, developing very beautiful, harmonious views that progress from a detailed foreground to vast views in the distance. This forest landscape of 1607 epitomizes Bruegel's contribution to the well-established Netherlander subject of travelers on the road. On a panel, perfectly sized to suit a domestic setting, he adopts a strong diagonal recession and delights in describing various sorts of people, from humble village folk to wealthy horsemen. As always, life and death are represented in balance. So we have the trunks of fallen dead trees lining the roadside of the, for the lively forest, um, together again with our um, skeletal remains of a horse. And we could easily uh, spend the afternoon traipsing about Bruegel's Flemish countryside and through the charming riverside villages such as this one. Among the whirling dancers, fish sellers, entourages, and crowds listening in rapt attention to an itinerant preacher, Bruegel himself makes an appearance uh, in one of only two reasonably certain self-portraits. So he's here. He re appears as a rather sober burger, beard intact, holding a pair of gloves perhaps accompanied by members of his family. In 1605, Bruegel renewed his correspondence with Cardinal Federico Borromeo in Milan. As Borromeo explained in letters and writings on art, the superbly rendered evocations of the natural world celebrated God's creation and were eminently suited for contemplation. And Bruegel took up a new subject in this vein, the flower still life. Bruegel's prestigious association with the court was indispensable. In the magnificent gardens of the, Bruegel, of the Brussels Kadenberg Palace, he was allowed to record a wide range of flowers at various times of year, during the year, which he composed um, into extraordinary flower still lifes. He emphasized to his patrons, who prized the veracity of each blossom, that they had been painted from life. 
On April 14th, 1605, he wrote to Cardinal Borromeo about this painting, which is painted on a copper plate. Quote, I have begun and destined for your illustrious lordship a bunch of flowers that is found to be very beautiful, as much as for their naturalness as also for the beauty and rarity of various flowers, of which a few are unknown and little seen in this area. For that reason, I have been to Brussels in order to depict from nature some flowers that are not found in Antwerp. End quote. He later informed Borromeo that this so-called bunch <laughs> would contain over 100 varieties, all of which would be life-size. Quote, I believe that so rare and varied flowers never have been finished with similar diligence. In winter, this painting will make a beautiful sight. This uh, mega bouquet, an utterly artificial compendium of blossoms from different seasons, was complemented in the Cardinal's collection by a smaller arrangement in a glass vase. Although Bruegel was by far the Cardinal's favorite painter, uh, the Cardinal also highly valued the work of another extraordinary modern painter, Caravaggio. He owned a single painting, this iconic still light of fruit, which he probably commissioned from Caravaggio in the late 1590s, uh, somewhere between 1595 and 1601. In the unpublished description of Borromeo's collection in his museum, um, he says that he cannot, it hangs alone essentially, he cannot, uh, he does not hang anything with it, so it's an unaccompanied uh, painting. Masters with such distinct visions, Caravaggio's monumental conception of his subject seen from straight on and Bruegel's observation translated into an imagined whole, um, that these two things should reside together in the psyche of their owner seems remarkable to us today. Yet in this regard, Barmeo was not alone. The Roman cardinals who avidly collected Car Caravaggio's work, such as Cardinal de Monte, um, also were in, owned works, and, and more than one, plural, works uh, by Jan Bruegel. We, in fact, will have the opportunity to experience the contrast in modern styles offered by Bruegel Caravaggio this winter, when Boy with Fruit, uh, which was painted a little bit earlier than Borromeo's still life, along with two other works, will go on display here at the Getty in the East Pavilion, steps away from the Flemish paintings uh, from November 21st through February 18th. The Cardinal had very specific requirements uh, on occasion, and he sent Bruegel um, directions in a rather firm tone. <laughs> One of the most important new subjects uh, Bruegel developed for Borromeo was the garland surrounding a central devotional image. This is the first Madonna and child in a flower garland, a new genre that combined close observation of nature with contemplative devotional practice, and often a very typical Netherlander's delight in creating illusion. It plays with the viewer's perception of real um, and the ideal and dimensionality. Bruegel painted the refined garland and his friend Hendrik van Balen, the virgin and child. Borromeo returned this painting to Antwerp and asked Bruegel to provide a landscape behind the central image. As a result, and it's not easy to see, but this is, you can see the sky there and the trees. As a result, the virgin and child seemed to hang in a forest in, within nature, uh, the holy figures seemingly alive yet also represented in two dimensions. It's easier to see a similar effect in this much larger and later garland that Bruegel painted with Rubens. The central figures appear in a shaped kind of format. It has a beautiful gold edge, um, but it, that edge has a sort of highlight, so it's not hanging straight within its garland. So there's this little highlight. There's an entire landscape behind. I think you can see the deer that are kind of that resting back here. So it's as if this whole array uh, is suspended from the boughs of trees. It was during the first decade, working for his patron in Milan, but also for the local market, that Bruegel mastered the art of collaboration, working with painters best able to complement his meticulous facture. His partnership with the German painter residing in Venice, Hans Rottenhammer, began in the 1590s, which began in the 1590s, continued on in the next decade. Bruegel and Rottenhammer exchanged copper panels, sending them back and forth between Antwerp and Venice for the contributions of their colleague. Amongst the most famous scenes Bruegel painted were the fantastical views of hell and the underworld. 
In this small panel, Christ descends to the underworld after his death to free Adam and Eve and the righteous. Bruegel's minute fracture fills the panel with delightful demons and bizarre monsters with fins, claws, fiery bad breath. <laughs> I, I would love to have a Halloween costume like this, actually. <laughs> um, Ruttenhammer's figures reflect the influence of the great Venetian painters, history painters, uh, Tintoretto and Veronese, and here they're exquisitely integrated uh, with the more graphic creations of Bruegel. In many cases, Bruegel devised the subjects with his, uh, for his collaborations, such as the garlands and the allegories of the seasons and the elements. In other cases, um, as in this subject, the banquet of the gods, um, which was often portrayed on a large scale by Antwerp's history painters, Bruegel will transform them to an exquisite small scale on copper. Um, here, Bruegel supplied the captivating rich details and miraculous miniature still life elements. A tremendously industrial, industrious artist, Bruegel prospered in these years. In 1604, he purchased the Mermine, the Mermaid, a large house in the Langenustrat with a garden, and he would own several other properties which he rented. In 1609, he purchased another larger dwelling, Den Bock, the Billy Goat. I love it. all these houses in Antwerp have names, so it's, it's kind of a fun thing. Um, Den Bock was comprised actually of two houses, um, again with a nice garden, which is in the Arenberg Strat. So, um, first house is here, along a new strat, and then the second one is over here. Um, this is the market for the tapestry uh, weavers, the tapisiers pont. Uh, so it was a quite a good place for Bruegel to be located. And this area is Rubens, where Rubens's large house and garden were located. So you can see that Bruegel, you know, um, both places were very close to his friend, very easy to get back and forth. In 1604, Bruegel married for a second time following the death of his first wife, Isabella de Yoda, in 1603. A new phase in the creation of joint works dawned with Rubens's decision to remain in Antwerp following his return in late 1608 um, and service to the Archdukes Albert and Isabella at their court, as their court painter. Equally important was the signing of the Twelve Years' Truce in 1609 between Spain and the, and the rebellious United Provinces of the North. Bruegel renewed his partnership with Rubens almost immediately with the return from war, one of their largest joint works. Venus, the goddess of love, disarms Mars, the god of war, divesting him of his armor and weapons with the help of her cupids. Meanwhile, the forge of Vulcan, Venus's husband, continues to produce armaments suggesting that peace brought about by love could cease at any time. The painting celebrates the concord of the 1609 truce and the cautious optimism felt by the many in the southern Netherlands. With its political implications, it seems very likely that the return from war was a commission given to the leading paper, painters in Antwerp, perhaps from the city magistrates or from the archdukes themselves, who may have intended it as a political gift. It was a major rediscovery when it was acquired by the Getty in 2000, having remained in an English private collection for at least 100 years, undetected by scholars. At that time, and over the years um, that followed, as we developed an exhibition about the collaborative works of these two painters, it was customary to assume Rubens was always the dominant figure, and to name the figure painter before the landscape or still life painter for collaborations. We have since learned that the partnership between Bruegel and Rubens was one of equals based on a profound friendship of affection and respect. It was a rare creative alliance that showcased their very different styles. Bruegel's lively miniaturist technique and Rubens' bold dynamic human forms to produce an exceptional final product. Their working process was not the same for each of the roughly two dozen works they painted together, but the majority of the subjects are ingenious elaborations on themes from Bruegel's oeuvre. The return from war evolved from the dramatic forge interior Bruegel devised a few years earlier um, in this allegory of fire for Cardinal Borromeo, which also shows Vulcan's forge. Note the display of precious objects on the credenza over here. The footed brazier, uh, this guy here, and the three-legged stool. We'll come back to those elements. <laughs> the arched forms of the architecture and telescoping tunnel 
were themselves inspired by Bruegel's experience of the classical Romans around Rome. This is an infrared reflectogram of the Getty painting. Bruegel took the lead in this commission, apparently reusing a large oak panel he had planned to use for a landscape. Uh, infrared reflectography shows his characteristic carts and sheep drawn on the prepared panel. Uh, it proved, I'm sorry, impossible to find an image to show you today that was clear enough. Um, but if you turn this pa uh, panel 180 degrees, about in here you have um, those little carts with the large wheels and a few sheep. Um, so it seems that this was um, initially going to be a, an outdoor or forest landscape. Bruegel turned the panel 180 degrees and roughly drew two figures, which are smaller than those Rubens would alternately paint. They're very rough and hard to see, but they are over here. Bruegel executed the entire setting and the still life of the armor um, we see on the left, as well as the other objects in the corner on the right, the brazier, the three-legged stool, and the bench. So here in the infrared, you can see these objects a little bit better. This is a three-legged stool here. There is this little brazier of coals, and there's a bench. This, these are the legs, and then the seat goes back. And then there are these circular forms here, which are the metal plates, a, a salver, and things like that. However, the decision was taken to paint larger figures in a different configuration. In the absence of documentation, we can only speculate about the reasons for this change. Perhaps Bruegel initially planned to work with another collaborator, or more likely in my view, Rubens devised a mon more monumental figure group, one that features the intimacy of the illicit lovers. Um, and he also here is uh, developing ideas from previous works, uh, reusing this cross-legged pose um, for Venus. I think Rubens was also interested in um, including the second theme of the painting, uh, which is the, an allegory of touch. So he's uh, coming up with a pair of figures that are you know, um, pressed together. Um, so the cold armor against the warm flesh of Venus. So uh, Bruegel's first efforts were covered over with a thin grayish layer. Um, of, of these still life elements here in the corner. Um, and you can see, I think here, there's this sort of gray, it's like a cloud, and it just masked all of the items underneath here. Um, and actually this, um, it turns out, was a rather common mode of correction um, when working in um, oil. So we have a number of sketches in Bruegel's oeuvre that show him kind of adjusting contours and things. It's worth noting that both artists compromised here to work on an unusual scale. For Bruegel, these are especially large still life um, of metal objects, and they reveal a very quick and energetic brushwork and texture. So it's a little, lots of little mini impasto catches the light. Rubens ad adapted to this scale with mid-sized figures, um, and he had to contend with his friend's unsettling approach to space. <laughs> yeah, the, the corridor moves strongly uh, back and upward, um, and so Rubens had to place the feet of Mars and Venus on a sloping foreground. We don't know how the artist actually worked on the painting, but given the need for oil paint to dry between um, sessions, um, and Bruegel's time-consuming technique, and Rubens' busy schedule and his buzzing studio, um, and then there's evidence that there was a, a handling frame on the edges of this painting, so a kind of a thin handle, if you will, so you could move it. Um, we believe that this panel was probably carried from this one studio to the other. As we've seen, the, studio, the artists lived near one another, so this would not have been difficult. It was just a short schlep from either of Bruegel's houses. Um, the return from war, however, concluded its journey on Bruegel's easel, so that he and his workshop could add the final elements that knit the still life and the figures together. Bruegel added a number of elements in the foreground appropriate to the armorer's craft, a balance, a compass, tweezers, clippers, and something that eluded me for quite a while, um, an object with a triangular opening, and it is in fact a ceramic crucible for melting precious metals. The back and forth working process and major revision to the composition during um, the execution of this painting, I think, testifies to the intimacy of the relationship between these two painters. 
The poignant portrait Rubens painted of Jan, his second wife, Katharina van Marienburg, and their two eldest children, Peter and Elizabeth, from the same period as the return from war, captures Jan's affable and lively character and the warmth that bound him to so many friends in Antwerp and abroad. Katharina and the children are painted with wonderfully thick, smooth strokes, giving them a vivid sculptural presence. The interlinked hands provide an especially affecting testimony to a close-knit family. I wonder if the original idea was to paint an independent portrait of Katharina and the children. Or perhaps uh, this was the first of a pair of pendant portraits of husband and wife. But Bruegel found the formality of such conventional formats unsuitable and asked Rubens to include him with his wife and children. He stands with his arm on the back of Katharina's chair, leaning forward slightly, but still not within the beam of strong illumination falling on his family. Rubens portrayed his friend as a genial, well-to-do husband and father, with no indication of his manual profession as a painter. In fact, his right arm is entirely obscured. From about 1610, Rubens assisted his friend with his correspondence in Italian with Carlo Borromeo. It's interesting to imagine how they came to this arrangement. Perhaps Rubens told Jan his Italian wasn't up to standard. Or perhaps Jan was delighted to hand over the quill after so many years of doggedly composing his missives. Rubens penned over two dozen letters in, the more articulate, in more articulate and eloquent Italian from that point on until the early 1620s, occasionally interjecting Rubens-isms, <laughs> um, and those are usually things like uh, quotes from classical literature, <laughs> um, and signing off with a more slightly signature as um, Giovanni instead of uh, Jan, which is Jan's preferred mode. <laughs> so uh, we have a little sense that Rubens couldn't quite hold back as a sort of amanuensis. In uh, 1622, Bruegel apologized um, for a belated reply, saying, quote, my secretary, my secretary Rubens, so Mio Secretario Rubens, is in France. <laughs> Otherwise, I should have written. <laughs> the correspondence between Bruegel Rubens in Antwerp uh, with the cardinal and his secretary, Ercole Bianchi, are full of cheerful references um, to Bruegel's friends, all leading Antwerp painters. He frequently refers to Mio Amico Momper, um, Joste Momper, the landscape painter, and Mio Amico Snyders, uh, the still life specialist, Franz Snyders, who Bruegel introduced to the Cardinal in 1608, and then had to write apologetically uh, for an unknown offense caused by the younger artist when he departed the following year. The decade following the signing of the truce was marked by prosperity and indeed a flourishing of artistic creativity. Bruegel returned to the theme of the paradise landscape and transformed it to a larger, more expansive format. The entry of the animals into Noah's Ark, signed and dated 1613, is amongst the most beautiful and best preserved of the genre, along with the fall of man, in which Rubens painted the figures of Adam and Eve, the serpent and the horse and the ape. So he sort of did this kind of little section here, serpent and horse. The pretext for Bruegel's composition is a familiar biblical story, uh, the animals assembling and entering the ark. As told in the book of Genesis, chapter 7, verses 7 to 9, God intended to return the earth to its pre-creation state because of humanity's misdeeds. Noah obeyed God's commandment and built an ark to save his family and a selection of species during the great floods. Rather than an imagined wild setting, Bruegel instead set Noah's task in the lush and tranquil landscape of the southern Netherlands, with a thick woodland on the left, a stand of tall trees on the right, and rolling hills atop which a tower of a palace can be seen. A disparate group of creatures occupies the small hillock in the foreground, a pair of European tortoises, their elaborately patterned shells meticulously rendered, are juxtaposed with guinea pigs from South America nibbling on peas. A single very spiffy chipmunk from North America and also Central and Eastern Asia sits between them and a pair of European crested porcupines. Their remarkably detailed white and black quills offer a spiny counterpart to the tail of, of the turkeys from North America. The male even has a loose feather on his breast. A diminutive pair of mice are offset by the sleek and powerful pair of lions. In the center, a Spanish stallion gazes in our direction as if turning from the parade to convey the dignity of the procession behind him. The stream of creatures 
some, but not all, in pairs, moves decisively along a well-trodden diagonal path, encouraged by one of Noah's sons in a red tunic tied with a yellow sash. Camels carry Noah's belongings, including a richly colored turkey carpet. The lumbering, half-seen forms of an elephant and ox suggest there are still more beasts to come. Large animals, bison, elk, wolves, and bears, emerge from their forest habitat and make their way over the hill to join the cavalcade. The procession on the right parallels the course of the river on the left, a calm precursor to the raging water soon to descend. The two axes draw the eye to the distant hulking form of the ark itself, set against a luminous sky. Flocks of birds wheel overhead as pairs of giraffes and other large animals ascend the ramp. Situated in the center, yet not the focus of the composition, Noah, his wife and daughter, seated on the ground holding a lidded basket with a flask and an alert lapdog, can be seen along with a well-laden donkey. Bruegel's relegation of the biblical subject to the middle ground and the background of the composition was part of a well-established tradition in Netherlanders' painting. The precisely described array of animals and birds distributed around Noah are Bruegel's real invention, innovations in this work. The individuality, beauty, and animation mark his unparalleled powers of observation and indeed personal access to a wide range of birds and animals in the Archducal Menagerie. The Burgundian rulers of the Netherlands had long maintained menageries. Over the course of the 16th century, under their successors, the Habsburgs, the royal collections of birds and animals came to represent the vast global reach of the Spanish Empire. Thus, the entry of the animals also celebrates the New World and its discoveries. Many species, such as turkeys from North America, had been present in the Netherlands since the early 16th centuries. Turkeys arrived about 1500 after discovery by Spanish explorers in the Caribbean and um, were brought to Seville by King Ferdinand of Spain about 1511. Adhering closely to the verse in Genesis in which God exhorts Noah to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth, uh, in Bruegel's paradise, the species mingle freely with both domesticated animals and indigenous European species. The Brussels menagerie also included several types of deer, which roamed a large park around the palace. Here, the Cadenberg Palace is visible in the background at the left, and the archdukes are surrounded by deer and fowl. The archduchess Isabel even feeds a docile doe by hand. Isabel was especially fond of birds and maintained a large aviary in the park of their Brussels palace. Inventories list many bird types of birds that they owned, canaries and nightingales, partridges, white and colored peacocks, ducks, etc. And they received many birds and animals and gifts, notably from Isabel's brother, Philip III of Spain, including parrots, macaws, and tiny tamarind monkeys. Accounts of her youth in Spain attest to Isabel's love of animals, particularly parrots and monkeys from the New World. In this portrait of the Infanta um, from the late 1580s, um, her um, tended Madalena tries to restrain, restrain two mischievous South American monkeys that were fashionable companion for ladies at the Spanish court, a golden lion tamarind from the rainforests of what is now Brazil, and a cotton head tamarind from Colombia. When she moved to the Southern Netherlands to marry and jointly rule with her husband Albert, Isabel brought a chaotic assortment of birds and animals with her. Spanish court protocol was exceptionally strict, and it's amusing to imagine Isabel, uh, herself a woman of spirit, surrounded by the cacophony and mess of her furred and feathered companions. In the tree at the left of Noah's Ark, we see a pair of scarlet macaws from Mexico, as well as a pair of yellow and blue macaws from what is now Brazil. By 1613, macaws of both sorts were kept uh, as pets even in the elite households of Antwerp, where they were prized for their beauty and rarity. A species of lovebird, probably from Africa, and an Amazon parrot occupy the top branches. And they perch among more familiar birds, owls and tits, as well as the lone pheasant, um, usually a ground dweller, <laughs> but elevated to adorn the bare branches. The thicker stand of trees to the right harbors other birds in a manner reminiscent of Jan's father's landscapes. Small forms are tucked amongst the branches. An owl faces the viewer, long associated with wisdom and darkness. Um, they were also known in, fo in folklore um, as a companion to travelers sojourning late. 
Below, out in the open, perches an African gray parrot, one of the earliest members of the parrot family to arrive in Europe from the conquered Canary Islands after 1402. They were supplied by Portuguese traders. African greys were particular favorites um, with Renaissance popes, including Leo X and cardinals for their exquisite plumage and remarkable skills at mimicry. Bruegel delighted in showing birds in flight, and the soaring, swooping, brilliant airborne jewels enhanced the beauty and animation of his scene. In at least one instance, Bruegel relied on a stuffed specimen. The birds of paradise zooming about like feathered rockets in the upper right were from Madagascar. First described by Antonio Pigafetta, who was Magellan's chronicler, they captured the imagination of artists, but not only for their spectacular plumage. Stuffed specimens were typically shipped without their legs, or the legs were kind of stuffed into the body cavity, leading to a widespread misunderstanding among scientists, including Gessner and Clausius, that these birds flew continuously because they had no legs. <laughs> Bruegel kept oil sketches of animals in his studio for reference. Um, on this particular panel, uh, kind of a little sketch pad of about 1616, uh, 16, um, studies of humble donkeys and cats mingle with uh, the Prose's monkeys, uh, who may have been uh, the Archduchess's pets. Some drawings survive. This marvelous study of an ostrich dated 1594 must record a bird scene in Rome. This engaging creature appears in the earliest scenes of paradise from the mid and late 1590s. The ostrich's gaze, or his size and penetrating gaze, created exciting elements of visual and scientific interest um, when seen um, opposed to the bulky and largely horizontal forms of land animals. Bruegel annotated the sheet, kind of confirming his first-hand experience. He notes that it's negen uh, foot hoge, so nine foot high, and there's a color notation at the left um, that says lichtgrau, which is light gray. So size and color. Although no study for them survives, Bruegel made a pair of imports from the New World into a virtual signature, the black and white guinea pigs in the foreground. Native to what is now Peru, they arrived in the Low Countries, perhaps via West Africa about 1580. Initially, Bruegel may have only had a passing familiarity with these cuddly creatures, um, as we see in his first efforts in the late 1590s were not particularly convincing. However, his representations soon gained more volume and convincing features. Guinea pigs, of course, reproduce easily. <clears throat> um, but from about 1600, Bruegel only paints the same pair, one with a black head and white nose, and one with a kind of stripe of black around the middle. Could these have been given to the Bruegel children by someone at court? Maybe the Archduchess Isabel, that would be nice. The entry of the animals uh, encapsulates almost a century of art and natural observation. The concentration and distribution of animals across the field of the Getty panel harkens back to the familiar compendia of the medieval bestiary illustrations. It also draws on the methodology and imagery of 16th century studies of the natural world and methods of classification utilized by Conrad Gessner and Ulysses uh, Aldrovandi at Bologna. According to Ariane Faberkolb, Bruegel was the first artist to visually classify art, uh, animals in painting. Bruegel's system of classification in this work, she says, is a visual catalog of animals and birds functioning as a type of micro-encyclopedia. He adopted the methodology of Gessner and Aldrovandi's encyclopedias, which grouped similar animals, so quadrupeds and birds, uh, which were then based on visual similarities. And then he subdivided them further, so there were waterfowl with webbed feet and waterfowl which inhabited the shore. Ornithologists classified the turkey, the peacock, and the ostrich as birds that nest on the ground. The pairing of the guinea pigs and porcupine may reflect a revision to Aldervandi's treatise, designating them semi-wild -claw, semi clawed animals. The quadrupeds, cattle, deer, goats, rams, sheep, pigs, camels, antelopes are grouped together on the right. They also represent clean beasts, those fit for human consumption. Bruegel places them in the appropriate habitat. On the left, the bittern, the heron, and the gallinule stand amongst the reeds, with storks along the shore behind them. Ducks paddle in the water, but bats, as flying creatures, are included in the sky. In Bruegel's paradise, creatures showed their true natures. Just as the great battle scenes and precious landscapes were animated by numerous mini-episodes, 
the entry of the animals into Noah's Ark is marked by many delightful characters. Bruegel's paradise was peaceful, but not dull. While the lions keep close tabs on each other, a pair of domestic dogs rush toward the waterfowl, barking. Directly behind the horse, a ram and a boar eye each other warily. A pair of cats run amuck in the tree, hosting the birds. Certain creatures are particularly significant, and they occupy conspicuous positions in the foreground. The pair of lions, the pair of frolicking leopards, and the magnificent great stallion. All three of them are borrowed from Rubens, signaling Bruegel's exceptionally privileged access to the contents of his friend's studio. Oil sketches and drawings are amongst the most closely guarded assets of an artist's workshop, so this is a mark of true friendship. Strikingly, Rubens allowed Bruegel to use his drawings of lions from the Archducal menageries. Um, he could have seen them either in Brussels or in Ghent, made about 1612 to 13. The combined sheets would later form the basis for a large painting, today in the National Gallery of Art. Bruegel may have invented the pair of interacting lion and lionesses, the lioness kind of swats at her partner, and he used them in his own panel first. Rubens then adopted them for use in this panel, where we see them here on the right. The leopards lolling under the hooves of the approaching bull and elephant are taken from Rubens' mythological painting, um, known as the leopards, uh, and this unfortunately is a painting that's been lost, uh, but we know it through a later copy. In, Bruegel, in Bruegel's panel, the two leopards unite both observation and artistic invention. The leopard um, on the left, uh, rubbing its head on its mate, seems convincing, while the second leopard, with its sinual, sinuous position and decorously arranged tail, I'm a little worried about this kink, um, <laughs> Its raised paw and open jaws is kind of a more stylish and con contrived creature. The majestic great Spanish stallion commanding the foreground and our attention is again a direct borrowing from Rubens, perhaps the greatest painter of horses in the early 17th century. The direct antecedent for this alert steed is Rubens' portrait of the Duke of Alva, painted while Rubens was in Spain in 1603-04. The Duke dressed as a commander and seen from below, strides forward. Rubens modified the horse's pose in succeeding years for numerous portraits. In the southern Netherlands at this time, the great sta Spanish stallion was particularly associated with Archduke Albert, who had led Spanish troops in battle against the for forces of the Protestant northern provinces. In paradise, the horse pauses, unbridled, its wild nature expressed through the animated contours of its body and the wavy tendrils of its mane. The head and chest are a particularly beautiful passage of painting in gray, white, subtle areas of pink on the muzzle and in the chest. When painting, uh, Bruegel actually altered the position of the ears, moving the position of the proper right ear inward so that it's uh, more attentive looking. Although we do not know for whom this work was painted, it was likely a member of the court, if not the archdukes themselves. Painted on a fine and unusually large piece of single plank of oak, the originality of the scene would have appealed to high-ranking patrons conversant with scientific literature and with the emerging zoological in inquiry. Bruegel continued to generate marvelously detailed and engaging scenes on an increasingly large scale. He was highly valued by the court, and some of his works served to present the benevolent and devout rulership of the archdukes. The wedding banquet reworks a 16th-century theme of festive outdoor peasant nuptials made popular by Jan's father. At the end of the second day, decade, the festive event here is seen from a bird's eye perspective, and it includes the archdukes themselves, um, who sit at the table along with one of Isabel's many dogs. So in this detail, here's the little head. In 1618, in a testament to Bruegel's high standing and extensive connections within Antwerp's artistic community, the Antwerp magistrates called upon him to orchestrate a special gift to Albert and Isabel in, 16, uh, in Albert and Isabel. Quote, two ingenious paintings representing the five senses on which 12 of the best masters of this city have worked to be presented to their most illustrious highnesses. Unfortunately, both canvases were lost in the 1731 fire that engulfed the Kaudenberg Palace in Brussels. These two copies, however, attest to the stunning complexity of the undertaking. 
They are imaginary views that would have been impossible without Bruegel's remarkable career in conceiving, organizing, and painting compendia. At the same time, Bruegel was working on the series of the five senses with Rubens, which are today in the Prado Museum. Uh, we see from left to right, allegory of taste, the allegory of touch, which as you can see is, takes place in, a, in Vulcan's forge. And this is a really quite closely linked to the Getty, uh, Rubens Bruegel collaboration. In the middle, the middle is the sense of allegory of the sense of smell. At the lower left, the allegory of sight. And the lower right, allegory of hearing. By this time, um, in their partnership, Bruegel's leading role was clear. While he included the famous works of earlier masters, including Raphael and the Antwerp painter Peter Artson, this is the Peter Artson here, um, there are well known works in this painting, um, this is the Allegory of Sight by Rubens, um, his Tiger Hunt, for example. Um, there's an equestrian portrait. Um, this is the type of garland that he and Bruegel had painted together. Um, and there's also a small framed copper of Christ healing the blind man by Bruegel himself here being studied by sight. Bruegel's career was tragically cut short at the age of 57 when he died during an outbreak of cholera in, um, in 1625, along with three of his children. His studio continued under his son, Jan Bruegel the Younger, perpetuating many of the subjects generated by his father. The legacy of Jan Bruegel's many partnerships and his service to his art in the Netherlands lives on through his astonishing paintings, created through diligence and the conviction that skillful command of the minute constituted a worthy endeavor. Thank you.